Thank you. Uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the two of us first. Um, we both work in the uh, Sydney office of Google. We work on the Chrome browser, uh, and uh, the two of us specifically mainly work on the CSS component of WebKit. Um, WebKit is the open source layout and rendering engine uh, that both Chrome and Safari share. Uh, but we have some other engineers in Sydney, also on Chrome. They work on things like extensions and apps, Chrome features, and accessibility. In fact, uh, half, of the Sydney, uh, half of the Sydney Chrome team is down here at the conference, and uh, we're all actually speaking. Um, so I'd like to hand over to Mike to give the first part of the talk. Thanks, Shane. Hi, everyone. So as Shane said, we're from uh, Google Sydney, working on the Chrome browser. And before, I'd also like to say that in, uh, the Chrome team in Sydney is hiring. So if you are interested in coming to Google to work on a cool open source project, uh, come and talk to us later on, or just apply directly. So what are we going to do in this talk? So what we want to present is essentially, uh, we know that we're, um, this is essentially going to be an argument about why native applications can and probably should be ported to the web. Now, we're not talking all native applications, of course. There are places where the web doesn't work so well. But what we want to look at is how easy is it to shift from developing native applications to web applications? Um, and what are, the, what are the drawbacks? What are the pros and cons? And what pieces are missing from the web if you're trying to develop native app, if you're trying to take what was a native application and get it onto the web? And what does the web provide that, na that a native application, the native application development doesn't? So this is, talk is really aimed at people who haven't really done web application development before. So if you're a, de if you're a developer on a big, uh, like a big website like MyBook or FacePlace, uh, this talk probably isn't for you. So um, at the end of this talk, what you should be taking away is basically an understanding of the fundamental components of state-of-the-art web app development and when it makes sense to consider writing a web app instead of a native application. And also some pointers and examples to the um, basic text that go, basic technologies that go towards making rich um, web applications. Now, as I said before, we both do work on Chrome, so we are both native application developers. So we're native application developers coming and talking to an audience composed primarily of native application developers about why you should develop your next app for the web which will get our native application used more. And the irony of this is not lost on us. So when I'm talking about web applications, in this talk I'm mainly concerned with the open web platform and that does not imply cloud. So if I if at some point in this presentation I talk about cloud apps, just s slash cloud app slash web app in your head and, it all, and that's what I mean. So what I, want to, uh, what I want to look at is some motivating examples of applications that were traditionally native apps that have, very, that have successfully made the transition onto the web. So the first class of applications that I want to look at are ones that are primarily text-based because uh, the web does text pretty well. So, Let's look at email. So 20 years ago, uh, email was primarily desktop or native. You would you know, use Pine or Mutt and you would download your mail off the pop server to your local machine. And if you didn't have access what, where the physical or via SSH to that machine, you couldn't read all your old emails. So yes, you could, you could turn it to the pop server, but you couldn't get to the old ones, you couldn't search, you couldn't do anything. And about 15 years ago, and yes, it was that long ago, um, the first web-based email applications started appearing. And these are things like Hotmail, and then subsequently Yahoo Mail, and then Gmail. And what this has meant now is that you can, you don't, you're not tied to a single machine anymore. You can read your email from any machine in the world that has a web browser on it. So this is one thing that web apps give you is universal access to your data. The other thing is when you go to that machine that happens to have a browser on it, you don't need to download anything extra. You don't need to ask your friend or the internet cafe, can I install Pine or Mutt on, the, on your machine? Or indeed, can I install SSH so that I can get back to my home machine? So the web gives you a no install, um, no install delivery, and this really reduces the activation energy needed for someone to give, to give your application a try. The next one uh, I want to consider is still text-based, but um, word processing or desktop publishing. So 
with these, these sort of native applications started appearing, you know, in the late, in the early 90s in, during the desktop publishing revolution. But what was common to them was that they were, again, tied to a, tied to a single, single screen, single keyboard, single person editing a document. Now, when peop what people wanted, really wanted to do was collaborate on writing documents. And so we'd copy them onto floppies and hand them around or USB sticks or whatever. And when everyone started getting networks and email, we'd start emailing them around. And anyone who's tried to collaborate on a document via email that involves more than two people will know that it very quickly degenerates into, a, into an edit war. Like, you know, you overwrite someone's changes and which version is the most recent. Now, on the web, approaching a word processing application from the perspective of a web application developer, the fact that, you're gonna, that you could have um, multiple screens and multiple keyboards interacting with the document is kind of part of the mindset that comes with it. And so this makes collaboration easier because you'll have designed it in from the get-go. You haven't taken a single user application and tried to bolt multi-user onto it. It just kind of comes as part of the package. Now, I'm not trying to claim I'm certainly not trying to claim that just by saying, well, I'm going to write a word processing application on the web, that automatically you get collaboration. There are certainly technical challenges involved, but what I wanted to highlight was more the mindset that developing a web application brings for the developer. The other thing is you don't have to email the documents around anymore. Uh, you can just send links. The web was built around links, and so with everything on the web essentially being if you think of, instead of documents, if you think of everything on the web as being an artifact that has a URI or a URL associated with it, and the fact that you can simply email around links, again, this reduces activation energy for people to give something a go. If you want someone to look at your document, you, don't, you just send them a link to it, and they can view it. You don't have to make sure that you have the right version of the application or whatever, because versioning of applications, everyone is always running the latest one. And lastly, I want to look at uh, another web app that kind of ties a lot of these things together, and that's GitHub. Now, GitHub is source control, and you might think, what's that doing on the web? Well, what it brings is, again, if you want someone to look at your, look at your project, there it is. You send them a link to it, and instantly shared. You can send them a link to a certain version of a file, um, and they can look at that version. They can comment on it. It gives you, it gives you a wiki. It gives you a bug tracker. It gives you, you a one-stop shop for people to come and collaborate with you on, on your code. Uh, it integrates social features, such as you know, how many people are tracking your project, et cetera. And it really helps you build a community around your project that if you just had a version control system like you know, Git or Subversion, that you wouldn't have that just living on your machine as a, um, as a, as a single native application. Now, the fact that the web so the web was originally built around text-based documents linking to each other, and so text-based things working well on the web kind of not so surprising. But the web you know, did grow the ability to display pictures, and so uh, gallery applications like Flickr and the like have really changed the way that people share photos online. Similar to the way digital cameras change the way that people take pictures, these have changed the way that people will share them. And so this is just an example. A screenshot I took yesterday, Flickr, the, the front page, six, six great pictures from around the world, which you wouldn't have seen any other way, because these are almost certainly not from professional people. They don't have galleries that you can go and look at their pictures on the wall. Um, but what it does mean is that with the sharing uh, and the linking, you can, they, they, can, they can easily share these. You can easily share them with your friends as well. And it's not just static images that the web can do. Um, we can also do dynamic, uh, dy dy dynamic image type editing applications. So this is uh, completely done in HTML5. And we can draw around on that. And that's all, again, all done in HTML5, all done on the web. So you can even think about doing applications such as image editing applications. Um, you know, Photoshop being, I guess, the gold native example in, the, in that space. Now, the final sort of class of applications that I'd, that I'd like to look at today is games. 
So this is uh, Farmville. Some of you may even recognize it. Um, and what it does very well is uses the strengths of the web to appeal to its target audience. So this is a casual game. And one of the things that casual gamers do is they only, generally only want to play for 10 or 15 minutes at a time. So by not having to install anything, they, they can just click a link, play the game. Uh, again, lowered activation energy, uh, no install. Um, people like building farms just to share with their friends. And they can do that just by sending a link around. Now, you might not think this is a terribly exciting application, but it has been moderately successful for its developer. <laughs> now, looking at a slightly more um, challenging, I guess, from a development perspective, is a game like Angry Birds. So there is a, complete, there is a HTML5 version of Angry Birds online. Uh, and in the interest of strict scientific accuracy, I think when, when they launched, they did actually require Flash for the audio component, but there's specification work going on to fix that up. But Angry Birds does run at a solid 60 frames per second in the browser. Um, and so you know, there's physics engines going on and everything. So this is, much, this is more complicated from a development point of view uh, than something like Farmville. But, and to be honest, this kind of represents, at the moment, the state of the art in, web app develop, in games on the web. Uh, in terms of speed, like I said, locked to 60 frames a second, um, interactivity. So it, in the case of games, something like Modern Warfare 3, probably not going to happen in the browser anytime soon. Um, and that's not just from a technology perspective, but also if you think about the target audience for something like Modern Warfare 3, they tend to be hardcore gamers who ha will have custom hardware, are happy to download gigabytes of data onto their machine, um, are happy to fiddle with drivers and tweak to get the very best settings. And the developers of these games are happy to, um, are essentially happy to work with, the, work with their target audience to deliver what they want, which is essentially the best, most immersive experience that they can have. So I think that AAA titles like this is probably an example of something that is not great for doing in the web browser, um, because you have to understand your target audience. So, I'd just like to quickly run through some of the benefits we've talked about. So there's universal access to your data, so like your email, available on any machine on the planet. Um, there's also the no install. So you don't, on the web, you have a delivery mechanism, and it always delivers you the most recent version of your application. So this is something we're trying to solve in Chrome. Uh, we're trying to get over the what, what version of the web browser do you have. You always have the latest version. And same is true on the web. Like, what version of Gmail do you use? What, does anyone even know that Gmail has a version number? Doesn't matter, you're always using the latest version. Collaboration is kind of built into, the, uh, built into web apps and the mindset of a web application developer. And as is sharing. So the web was built around links to documents and uh, the web developers have kind of extended this uh, into building applications and links into their applications, uh, links to photos, etc., which just makes sharing easy. Browsers lay things out. This is, what they, this is kind of what they do, and they're pretty good at it. And so if you want to lay out text-based stuff, as, you, as you've seen, laying out text and text-based applications tends to work pretty well. And the web as an IDE, uh, unlike a lot of native application development, the web is pretty, all the um, behind-the-scenes stuff in the web is all text-based. So all of the um, code and layout that you'll write is all text-based, so there's nothing um, proprietary, there's no like graphic, you don't, have to use a, you don't have to use a GUI to lay stuff out. And these things, it doesn't get compiled into binaries, binary resources or anything that are opaque to you as a developer. And finally, uh, it is a very open and modular environment. So uh, in previous talks, we've heard about things like jQuery or Dojo and various toolkits that can work together to abstract away some of the parts of the web if you want to build applications faster. And generally, by and large, these will work together. Uh, there are cases where they, they may not, but by and large, they do work together because often these things tend to do one thing and do it well, and they all speak the lingua franca of the web, which is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Now, some drawbacks, of course. Um, now, the layout for web apps can be more involved than for desktop apps if you're, just, if you're trying to do widget type things. So often desktop apps will come with a widget set, which you can drag and drop and place. Uh, whereas on the web, we t it tends to deal with more fundamental components like divs, or which, which tend to be, which are just boxes. And some of the layout you, you as a developer may have to do, or you can use a toolkit which will help you do that for you. 
Now, distributed code can make debugging difficult. And by distributed, I mean when you're developing a web app, this often enforces the separation between client and server. Um, now, if you've been developing desktop apps with the MVC type um, paradigm, the, the, that corresponds kind of to the model and the view. But often on your desktop, they're running on the same machine, whereas this enforces the separation. And sometimes when you find a bug, it's unclear whether it's on the server or on your client. And any web devs who have been sitting in this room have been waiting for this one to crop up, which is cross-browser compatibility. Getting your, web, getting your apps to look precisely the same in all the browsers uh, has been traditionally, and I'll be kind, a bit of a challenge. But for one of the first times in history, we do have the major, major browser vendors actually believing in open standards. And just early this week, we had a browser mini-conf where there were Chrome people and Mozilla people in the same room all talking about how we can make our browsers and the web better. And I'm going to mention security here. Now, you may think, but security is always good. Of course, it must be a benefit. I'm mentioning it here as a drawback because the web as a sandbox does restrict the, the sort of applications you can develop. For example, you can't just go writing across a user's file system. Um, so if your app does involve writing over a user's file system, developing it as a pure web app may not be what you want to do. And at this point, I'd like to uh, mention an example of an app that kind of straddles a boundary, and that's Steam. Steam actually embeds WebKit for all of its layout. So by and large, for layout purposes, it is a web application. But it runs in, they've embedded WebKit inside a native shell. And I'm pretty sure, I don't know exactly why, because I haven't talked to the Valve guys. But I'm pretty sure that's because they want to write to your file system to download the games and stuff. So Steam is kind of an example of where the developer is taking advantages of, the, of web apps in terms of the power of the layout that it gives you and downloading the latest version and stuff. But they've had to wrap it in their own shell because they need things like native access to your file system. So with that, I'd like to hand over to Shane now, where he's going to be giving you some pointers to some uh, basic technologies and uh, how to go about developing your first web app. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so I will be doing those things. But first, I just want to quickly address a couple of myths about web application develop, uh, development. <clears throat> the, first is that, the first myth is that designing web applications is hard. This isn't strictly true. It's not harder to, to design web applications. It's just different. Um, and I think you know, there's a host of differences between building uh, native applications and building web applications. But there's, there's two major differences that I think you need to keep in mind. The first is that uh, there's a data boundary and a latency boundary between the server and the client. And you're pretty much free to break your application up into client and server components any way you want. Um, but you do want to ensure that when you do that, you choose a split that minimizes the impact of the data transfer and the impact of the latency. Um, the second major difference is that when you're building your user interface, you are constrained to use web technology. And um, we'll talk about some of the, uh, the specific pieces of web technology that you can use to build user interfaces in just a minute. But uh, something that I want to make really clear up front is that they are very, very different to the kinds of things you use on, on the desktop to build applications. It's quite a different model, and you need to think about things in a different way. Um, of course, there is, there is a piece of technology called Canvas, which is basically a way of having a, a bitmap that you can procedurally draw to inside your web application. Um, and you could take Canvas and just plot pixels and, you know, Port, G, port across GTK and start using a widget library and do everything just like you did on the desktop. Um, if you do this, you're at a distinct disadvantage. You don't get most of the benefits of being on the web. Um, but like Bruce said in his keynote yesterday, you're probably not the only nut job out, here, out there that thinks this. Um, you just need to find the other 49 of them and go to town, if that's the way you want to go. Uh, the second myth is that you can't do Unix-style applications on the web. Um, and I want to let you in on a little secret here. Uh, Google.com is really a command line application. It just happens to live behind a browser window. So the browser is essentially a, a command shell. You type commands in, and uh, you know, they get sent away for processing, and the results come back and are displayed. Um, uh, so you, know, you, you, you type your search query into Google. It gets sent off to a small application, which is designed to do exactly one thing, which is look up a vast database of search of, uh, of web pages, it comes back with a set of results and sends them back to the browser, and the browser prints them out for you. Um, and in fact, if you think about the Unix philosophy of small applications that do things well, which you can connect using stuff like pipes, 
uh, to provide more complex behaviors. This is basically, uh, we, we have this on the web, it's called mashups. Um, and you know, the idea of a mashup is to take a bunch of existing web services and modify them and, or mix them together to produce something new and uh, more powerful. Uh, and in fact, we saw uh, anyone who went to the uh, Tux in Space talk yesterday would have seen a really great example of a mashup. Um, here we have uh, Google Maps being mashed up with a custom data source that provides real-time telemetrics about where the uh, where the balloon was and where the tracking car was. So Maps is is quite good at displaying map data. Um, the custom telemetry is hooked up to all of the backends that it needs to be to be able to provide information about location in real time. And together you have this really great visualization app that actually you know shows you uh, quite useful data for a specific purpose. Okay, um, how many people here have actually never never written any content for the web before? <laughs> Excellent, we don't need to do the next bit. <laughs> um, I'll just really, really quickly, I, I was gonna give you a demo here, but I, I don't think it's necessary. Really quickly, HTML provides con uh, describes the content, CSS styles that content, uh, JavaScript gives you the dynamic behavior, and the DOM provides programmatic access, ties the three together, allows you to uh, modify aspects of you, your user interface at runtime from JavaScript. So I want to talk about a few different categories of useful web technologies. This is a really light overview of different things that you can use. It's, it's a bit of a cherry pick of stuff that I find interesting. Um, we're going to talk about technologies in four categories. We're going to talk about text in display and rendering, in communications, in storage, and, and in environment enhancements. And at the end of this, I'm gonna give you a really simple demo that just shows how you can tie a few of these things together um, with very little code and very little effort to add functionality to, uh, to web applications. So we'll start with display and rendering. Now there's, there's three basic rendering options available on the web. Um, HTML gives you a kind of a flow layout now this is a massive, massive simplification and given that you've all written content before you all know this, but uh, basically flow lay layout gives you boxes of content that stack beside each other until they overflow the, the side of the container and then they wrap and drop onto a new line and, and keep stacking. Um, now this is pretty much exactly what you want for the vast majority of text content, but it can be difficult for laying out windows or web apps um, where you want a lot more control. Next we have SVG, and this is a, a vector-based language for graphics. Uh, and we have Canvas, which gives you uh, that uh, simple immediate mode procedural API for drawing bitmaps. Um, and there's something quite interesting about these three APIs, which is a distinct departure from the desktop, because, I mean, you can do flow layout now on the desktop. You can do, obviously, vector graphics, and you can do procedural graphics. Uh, but on the web, these three things interoperate really quite well together. So for example, it's very easy to embed SVG or canvas boxes in HTML. Uh, similarly, you can embed HTML inside SVG and render HTML or SVG content onto a canvas. In fact, I think you can even use a canvas background as uh, part of your SVG content. Um, and on top of this, you can describe layers in your document uh, really quite easily put different content in each, in each layer and have those layers sit on top of each other and use opacity and transparency to define what gets shown through. Um, I'm just gonna give you a really simple example of this. Any minute now. So here we have uh, I really should have brought a pointer to this, shouldn't I? Here we have uh, some, some divs. So this is some, some traditional standard HTML content. We have a, a little SVG shape, and we have a canvas, and we have uh, a small JavaScript, uh, a small piece of JavaScript that, that draws into the canvas. And then we have some styling, some CSS styling up the top that basically makes sure that these things all sit on top of each other and just shifts them around slightly. Um, and we, when we look at what 
this appears as right you can see that we've got we've mixed our text content our SVG shape and our um, bitmap and uh, that by by doing this we, we, we have a really powerful way of of, um, of using the different techniques where they're, where they're where they're most useful. Um, contrast this to the desktop, where often if you want to do something like this, um, it would be a significant amount of effort just to get it all, uh, all lined up. And um, you know, if you're using different libraries, you're going to have issues with transparency. And you might need to render stuff off into bitmaps and import it. It, it, it can be a real pain. So on top of these three basic options, you also have some more experimental uh, things appearing. First of all, we have WebGL. Um, this is a way of embedding uh, 3D content into into a web page, and uh, you can even define shaders more or less in JavaScript. So that's a, a really exciting new development. And uh, in the other direction, there's there's some specifications just coming out now for more advanced flow ba flow based layout, like Flexbox and Grid. And these promise to make it much easier to to build web applications. Um, in HTML. Now, WebGL's been around for a little while now, um, for about six months, and we're starting to see some really exciting demos out on the web. Uh, on the other hand, Flexbox and Grid are very much in the specification stage, so you'll have to wait a little while before being able to use those. Okay, next we have uh, the area of communications. And starting at the top, this is, we have set at HTTP requests. This is what the web was built on. This is the basic idea of a user visits a web page, um, by typing a URL into the bar or clicking on a link, right? That sends a request back to the server. The server sends the relevant HTML content back to the user. Uh, and originally, this was it. This was all you could use. Um, if you wanted to update your page with new data from the server, either you had to entice the page user to click on a link, or you had to use JavaScript to refresh the page manually. Now, um, I don't know if anybody remembers the very first versions of Hotmail. Um, this is exactly how they worked. You know, you clicked on a, an email heading to, rec and to, to, to view the contents of the email, and that would reload the entire page, right? And the new email would appear, and then you'd get the sidebar and the, and the, and the menus and everything. And it was often slow and painful, but that was just the only way that you could do things. Um, and in fact, it was Microsoft who delivered the first innovation in this area uh, with a little guy called XML HTTP Request Objects, or XHR. Um, and the idea here is that uh, from JavaScript, you can request additional content can be sent, uh, to be sent to an already loaded website. So uh, with the email example, for example, uh, with the email example, when the user clicks on the email heading, that fires off some JavaScript, which creates an XHR um, that pulls just the email contents from the server, and then that, that content gets dynamically inserted into the DOM without reloading the rest of the page. Um, now, Microsoft mainly used this for enterprise offerings, and as it turns out, it was actually Google that popularized this approach in consumer web apps. Um, and the te technique eventually came to be known as Ajax, but it's pretty much how all of these things work now. Um, and the next major step is still in progress. Uh, it's known as WebSockets. And the really nice thing about these guys is that uh, web servers can actually push content into a web page without there being a request from the page at all. Um, so you've got a genuine bidirectional pipe for communication. Um, now, WebSockets are still pretty experimental, um, but Firefox and Chrome do both support them, and the IE10 developer pre preview does as well. Um, and in addition to that, there's a few libraries like Browser Channel um, that can emulate a bidirectional channel for you, although it's, it's very slow. It uses techniques like polling to, to detect changes from, from the server. And finally, there's an increasing number of libraries that are appearing that build on the functionality that stuff like WebSockets or browser channels provide to deliver advanced functionality to the browser. Um, now, I've included Fay here as, as an example, because um, I'm going to use it in a demo later, and I really like it. Um, what Fay basically gives you is peer-to-peer uh, -peer messaging between browser windows, where you've got two users who are both viewing the same, the same uh, or page content on the same host. Fay gives you a really nice, simple way of doing peer-to-peer -peer -peer communication in JavaScript between those two users. Um, and actually, Fay is a really great example of a very open modular library of the sort that Mike was talking about before. Uh, it works with pretty much any other library in the browser. And uh, there's multiple implementations of the backend component, uh, so you can add Fay functionality to your favorite web server, uh, whichever it may be. <coughs> now, 
Next we have storage. Traditionally with web applications, uh, all, the, all of the data of your, web, of your app would be stored on the server. Um, but there's now a number of APIs that allow you to store data directly in the client as well. Um, I mean, there have always been cookies, but uh, cookies are very limited. Um, we now have uh, session storage for storing data relevant just to the current window, and local storage, which is data relevant to a host, but that persists beyond individual sessions. Um, both of these give you a few megabytes of a very simple uh, key value style API. Um, and there's some other standards emerging too. Uh, for example, IndexedDB, which provides you a more complex object-based store. Um, and it even allows the storage and retrieval of binary blobs of data. Um, so you can store image resources and things like that. Um, and AppCache, which provides a mechanism for caching all of the source and resources of a web app of a web app locally, so that after a user has been to your application for the first time, they don't have to then go and download all of the code every other time that they visit your site. Um, these, these are very new, and they're just starting to appear in browsers. Finally, uh, there's a significant amount of effort that has been put into enhancing the environment of the web itself. Uh, for example, jQuery. Um, has been discussed before. It's a JavaScript library that gives you a bunch of different utility functions, and it also gives you some much more powerful ways of accessing and modifying the DOM. Uh, CoffeeScript is a really lightweight compiler that gives you a language which is like JavaScript, but it doesn't have many of JavaScript's wrinkles. And uh, Native Client Knackl is, it provides a way to, to safely run compiled binary code in your website if, for example, you absolutely need that last few percentage of uh, uh, that last few percent points of, of performance, or you have um, legacy code that you really want to use inside your application, but you don't want to put it to JavaScript, or even not code that isn't legacy, but is quite complex, and, and you just don't want to go through the effort of, of turning it into JavaScript to use it. For example, crypto stuff. Um, so this is you know, a, a really, really small set of libraries and a small set of examples. It's, it's a, a very lightweight survey of some of the things that are available. If you want to do a deep dive and see um, many of the, other, of the other options that are out there for you, um, there's a really great resource called HTML5 Rocks. Um, this, this website gives you uh, presentations, gives you code samples, it gives you tutorials, uh, and it talks about a lot of the really exciting new technologies that are becoming available on the web platform. Um, and the nice, nice thing about this site is that all of the code samples are open source, ready for you to grab and, and start using and modifying at will. Okay, so I'm going to, uh, as promised, give you a small demo now. Um, what I want to show you is, is just how easy it is to take an existing web application and add you know, a social feature to that. So I'm not starting with an existing web application, I'm starting from scratch. But I want to, I, I want to show you just how little code is required uh, to provide, in this case, chat functionality. So, um, So here we have uh, uh, you know, two different people on two different browsers looking at the same website. And um, you know, they can chat. Now you might not think this is particularly exciting, but um, what is exciting about this is uh, just how easy it is to provide functionality like this. So let me pop up the code. This is, this is the, the, the client side. Um, this, this is the, the HTML that gets downloaded into the client. You can see there's, there's you know, a tiny bit of HTML that just sets up a few, few areas. Um, a little bit of style to make it look, you know, more than, than just terrible. Uh, and a little bit of script to provide the functionality. And all this script does is, uh, well, we can see some use of jQuery here. Um, uh, one, one of the 
features that jQuery gives you is an ability to use CSS selectors to grab a list of content that matches a particular selector from your web page and then apply changes across that list um, using, using very simple function calls. I'm not actually using it to apply things to a list because I've only got one of each case here, but um, th that's one of the things that you get. So we, we find the, the input box, which is where you type your chat messages, and we register a key press handler for that, that when called, checks for carriage return. Uh, if it sees one, grabs the message, grabs the username, and publishes to a Fay client that message and username. And the Fay client is set up here. I mean, it's, it's not very difficult to do. Uh, and we've also subscribed uh, messages from the Fay client to update the results panel with new content. So it's really that simple. I mean, that, that's all that's involved in providing something like chat on the web today. Uh, and the server is, is likewise incredibly simple. This happens to be a node server. Um, all we've done is we've created a server to, uh, a server process to, uh, to serve the HTML page. We've created a Fay node adapter, which is the backend uh, that the clients talk to. We've associated the application and the, and the node back, uh, the backend to each other and then we listen for incoming requests. Uh, and that, that's, that's literally all there is to it. So I'd like to finish up now. Um, in conclusion, the, there, are, there are lots of advantages gained by moving native applications to the web. Um, there are obviously some potential pitfalls as well, and, and some things are going to be harder. But we believe that for a, a large class of applications, the difficulties are outweighed by the advantages if you do choose to go this route. Um, I've, I've given you a very brief overview of some of the things that you can do on the web and some of the technologies that you may not have thought were available. Um, so you know, please, go forth and write web apps. Thank you. Okay, uh, who has any questions? All right. So a couple of quick questions, <coughs> sorry. First off, in terms of licensing of web apps, do you have any recommendations? And secondly, is Pinnacle stalled or is it still going strong? So, uh, so for the first one, in, in terms of the licensing web, like web apps, do you mean like what license you should put on your HTML source code or? I guess that's entirely up to you. I don't know. Um, I don't have a good recommendation, to be honest. I mean, if. So if, just to clarify then. Yep. Uh, if you're wanting to make sure that your, for example, that your application stays free in open source software, um, is there a, one criticism made of moving applications to, web, uh, to the web is that it's harder for license control to take place? And it's a lot easier for someone to just nick your code or just think because it's on the internet they can do whatever they like with your code. Obviously you can't do anything about that, but are there any proactive steps that can be taken um, to ensure that code stays open and free? Um, there's a bunch of non-web application native apps, you know, with their source code available on GitHub and other providers because it's just so convenient to do that these days, right? Um, if, if you... It, it is true that all of the text of your web application is available um, to people who are using the application, but it's also true that in the vast majority of free and open source software, that's going to be the case anyway, because you know, even if you're not using GitHub or SourceForge or one of these various providers, you're going to have, you're going to, have to provide your source on request. That's the very definition of open source. So I don't, I don't really see any difference here. And I'm not a lawyer, but I, from, what I, from what I understand, is if you were to put your license at the top of every file that gets transmitted, even if that even if that file has been obfuscated or whatever, if you have the license up the top, then that compels people to obey that. And if they choose not to, I don't know what we can do about that. Well, it, it's also copyrighted by the goal of the goal that's your Yeah. Your license says otherwise. So infringing happens, you know, whether someone can read the license or not. Okay, any other questions? 
um, you had the quick example of Steam embedding WebKit, and like there's whole frameworks out there, say for instance PhoneGap, which focus pretty much on letting people create what looks like a native app, but simply um, giving the web view access to whatever bits of native functionality um, the browser itself can't provide. Is it, it, would it be worthwhile taking the approach of looking at those apps and looking at what features they're using, for instance, from PhoneGap to prioritize what's the features that are missing in a web browser that are making people go the web view embedded route instead? Like what na bits of native functionality they need most should be the next priority, say, for um, the HTML5 uh, working, or what, what WG to be looking at? So certainly the, the what WG, so for the, the what WG is the working group that looks after the HTML specification. Um, those discussions are ongoing, um, and it really does require the buy, like if you want to put something into the web platform itself, you do need the buy-in of browser vendors for doing that. And this does come with the considerations of security. Um, like if you would be opening up your um, application to, you know, you would be opening up your users to malicious, uh, malicious apps or whatever. Um, so in Chromium, one thing we've done is uh, you can write extensions. And extensions have access to an, a, a more, somewhat more powerful API than a standard web page would. And the way we've, we've looked at trying to address that is by asking the user for permission to say that this app, this extension, for example, wants to be able to look at all of your browsing data on all websites. So an, extent, uh, an extension that does things like modifies the web pages that you visit will request that permission. Um, so that's kind of the approach that we've taken. That, that is uh, not a standardized approach at the moment, but that's kind of the best we've got at the moment. Okay, any more? So the question I always always run into is that um, I'm building a web app that has to display a lot of data to the user, and this is scientific data, so I want to give the people who are looking at it, well, the, the most, the biggest view at the data possible. So if the people are running their browser on a big screen, I would like to scale up to the big screen, but obviously I have to scale down if the screen is smaller. This tends to be really hard to do in a portable fashion on web apps. So I mean, on a native application, I usually don't have any problems because if I full screen, I just full screen, that usually tends to work pretty well. On a web application, either my full screen application is going to be confined to a small bit in the middle of the screen, so it fits to the smallest screen size I aim for, or will, will look really crap on a, a small screen. How do you fix that? There are actually, uh, events that you can hook into to detect, to detect screen size changes and they will give you information about the size of the screen. So you can just use those to... Is that your question? Or I mean, there's another issue about trying to do that declaratively and there are some specification efforts underway to try and allow you to detect um, as part of, not as part of your JavaScript program but as part of your CSS style um, what the bounds of the screen are um, and that gives you, you know, a, a, a more upfront way of, of making those changes as well. I'd also like to give a quick shout out to a J JavaScript API that has only just recently appeared, which is the programmatic full screen, where you can click on that and it will actually go full screen. That was implemented in Chromium by the Sydney team, so yay Australia. <laughs> okay, more questions? In my experience of writing web apps that are desktop grade web apps, you have to make a commitment to a JavaScript framework that handles the rendering of the HTML elements for you, cross browser, if you want any chance of retaining a sanity. I personally use XJS, but there's other ones like jQuery or et cetera, et cetera. I'm wondering what Google do for their web apps. So it depends on the app, but I think by and large we use Clojure and Clojure widgets. And so far as I'm aware, that's open source. I think so. Yeah. Yep. Oh, I have some or views on in some cases, sorry. <laughs> have some different views on this based on frameworks, but what's your recommendation based on you helping people getting started here regarding the security aspects of web apps, so the AAA, the authentication, authorization, access and auditing, those sorts of requirements. So, for example, your simple chat client was very simple, but when we've got to look after users, we've got to protect users, who can access what, what are your recommendations as far as frameworks, et cetera, for 
handling the security side of applica uh, web applications that maybe with desktop applications aren't quite the same issue. I, I'd like to draw a dis distinction between, uh, well, I don't think security is an issue that arrives because we've gone to the web. Security is an issue that arrives because of the features that we're able to provide on the web. So, for example, you don't need to worry about security if you're offering static web pages um, with no personal, personal content. But once you start to provide um, user logins and chat functionality and social features, then it becomes really, really important. So uh, if you were to try and build these kind of features into native applications, you'd have exactly the same issues. Um, that doesn't answer your question. I don't have any specific recommendations that I want to give you for security, but it is a really hard problem, and it's definitely one that you need to think about very carefully. I'm sorry, I, I can't give you anything better than that. For handling user identity, though, there was a talk at the Browser MiniConf earlier this week on browser ID, which is uh, an anonymous way of, uh, sorry, a way for users to provide, to prove that they uh, own a particular email address so that they can log into a website, but doing so in an anonymous fashion. So browser ID is something to look, at, look for for the user account management side of things. Okay, can we have some questions over this side of the room? Anybody? Um, I was reading an article recently that indicated that LibreOffice were running a demonstration of a preliminary web version of their native application uh, in which they were using uh, the HTML5 canvas element for either the entire user interface or a very large part of it. It wasn't clear from the article that I was reading as to exactly whether they were using it for everything uh, with uh, GTK3. And I was wondering to what extent you think uh, application developers, either those who are bringing in uh, web applications from a native environment or those who are writing web applications from the beginning, uh, will use Canvas to do a lot of the layout and the uh, construction of their user interface, because obviously that has some interesting accessibility issues with it. And so I was wondering from your web browser developer's perspective, seeing what, uh, where the development is heading, uh, what kind of usages of it you would be um, envisaging in the next several years. So Canvas is attractive because it allows you to plot a pixel. And if you can plot a pixel, you can take over the world. Um, but it does mean that you have to build from the ground up. Now, the GTK example is kind of interesting because there was someone who did get GTK working in Canvas by having a server where he rendered his, uh, like all the widgets got rendered and were then transmitted as pings over to the browser and then plotted into a Canvas. And he got Firefox working that way, in, like Firefox inside the browser, rendering in Canvas, from a, from a remote server. That's so, not in GTK. That's not in GTK. It's not just a hack. Good times. It looks like they found the other 49 nut jobs. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, to. <laughs> From, from the, from the, from the um, perspective, like, and like I said, that, that, that is attractive because it, it makes, if you're coming from a, a native environment, it makes the browser look a lot more like your native environment. But essentially what you're doing is you're, taking a, you're, you're definitely taking advantage of the uh, no install part of, uh, that the web gives you, but you're not really getting, um, you're, you're missing out on a lot of the features, like except the, the one that Jason pointed out is accessibility. Um, you are essentially locking out all of the accessibility features that the browser gives you, um, meaning that you're, there's, a, that there's a community of users that will not be able to use your application unless you do everything yourself from scratch. And if you're an everything from scratch person, then, and you have the resources to make that work, and that works for you, then by all means, you, you can develop your apps that way. There's, there's, there's nothing stopping you. There's, there's a bunch of different things that you're going to miss out on. Um, deep linking is going to become more difficult. Uh, you're, by default, making your application completely opaque to any kind of crawler so that you won't be indexed by search engines. Um, maybe that's not a problem for you. Uh, you are not able to take advantage of any of the, the text-based layout that the web gives you, and that stuff is really useful if you are doing text-based layout. It's just the list goes on and on. There are so many things. If you go and try and use a canvas to implement your UI, there's so many things that you're going to miss out on. Oh, good. Um, I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. So if everyone could give these two fantastic presenters a hand. <laughs> Thank you very much.
much. Thank you. All right. Uh, now it's lunch break, everybody. <laughs>